Uh, my name is Jim Hinckley. Uh, in Kingman, I'm known as the chief troublemaker. I'm always stirring up things and stirring the pot. And uh, we've uh, created a lot of uh, uh, changes in Kingman, largely through the grassroots level. But I'm also the author of a few books and uh, trying to make a career out of telling people where to go. That's, that's basically what I, what I do now. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who made this possible. Thank you for the invitation and, and uh, hope I can be a part of the changes that's taking place here in Tucumcari. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind as I go through this is that not all economic development is tourism, but all tourism is economic development. And a lot of communities, they separate the two. You have an economic development director or a tourism director and seldom do the two meet. And they have to go hand in glove. And if you make a community a place people want to visit, you make it a community where people want to live, raise families, open businesses, and retire. And I think Tucumcari is ideally suited for all of this. Right now, heritage tourism, that's a catch-all phrase, basically. Heritage tourism is the fastest growing segment of the tourism industry. And like I say, it's really a catch-all. It's adventure tourism, culinary tourism, religious tourism. And to kind of break that down a little bit, these are all fancy terms, but basically what you put this all together and it equals Tucumcari. You have adventure tourism here in the area, you have uh, culinary tourism, ecological tourism is close, sustainable tourism is a little bit more difficult, and cultural tourism here, and of course educational tourism with your wonderful museums here, and the projects that your uh, Mason Lands Community College has. So if this sounds like, in a nutshell, tra it is traveling to experiences, places, artifacts, and activities that authentically represent the stories of the people of the past to visit cultural, historic, and natural sites. Basically a Route 66 experience. That's the core of heritage tourism. And last night I sat and visited with 50 folks from Norway who were spending the evening in your community. And it's, it's always amazing to see people from all over the world. Sometimes we get so close to things we don't see it. And I'm still amazed that people from all over the world come to travel a road. This is specific to New Mexico. And these are uh, statistics from your New Mexico Tourism Department that consistently New Mexico rates higher than any place else in the United States for heritage tourism on numerous levels because of the scenery, the culture, uh, the unique dining experiences. And tied in with this, what a lot of people get focused on is Route 66, especially in the Route 66 communities. But you have a second component. One of the second largest draws with heritage tourism is the American Southwest. And you know, it, it can be very daunting in communities like this. You've lost a lot of your population, you're struggling to maintain an infrastructure for a larger population, and you have a rural location, you feel like you're being eclipsed sometimes by some of the neighboring communities. And I wanted to share with you a few things from some communities that have faced very similar problems. And I try to encourage you how they have made some pretty dramatic transitions and transformations. This is Atlanta, Illinois, basically a small farming community. And Bill Thomas, behind all of these initiatives, there was a leader, there was a, somebody with vision that could do pinata impersonations. Somebody who could take a beating and still keep the focus. And in, in Atlanta, Illinois, it was Bill Thomas. And the key to what he did was provide visitors with engaging, authentic experiences that recreate Route 66 related experiences and develop new and engaging authentic experiences. They've reopened the Palms Grill for an example. Uh, the city acquired an old rooming house and they worked to get it open uh, to create a 1930s boarding house experience. And they created an arcade museum that bridges a lot of gaps uh, with age groups. It's everything from pinball machines from the 1930s to the 1980s arcade machines like Frogger and and uh, 
But what he's done with this is pretty dramatic. A couple years ago, Atlanta, Illinois, and Atlanta is a really small town. Basically, they have about two blocks in their downtown district. And almost every one of those storefronts was, was empty. Pontiac, right, uh, Atlanta right now is actually a destination community in Illinois. And probably, I know, the dollars and cents is what a lot of people, I mean, that's what drives this. Let's face it, even if we enjoy this, it's the money. That's what drives this. That's what gives the incentive to, to, to develop these things, to keep these going. This is what a community needs to thrive on. Atlanta got very serious on this. And uh, in about a four year period from 2010 to 2014, when they started creating unique partnerships between the private and the city and developing some of these properties and focusing on what the tourism wanted to create this experience, get people there, they had a 43% jump in sales tax revenue. Now since then, of course, it's not been quite that dramatic, but they've been running four, five, and six percent increase in sales tax revenues for each of the last few years. We've got kind of a few pictures here from Atlanta. It's hard to believe, but all of this was empty storefronts just a few years ago. This is one of the poster children for a community that can really be transformed is uh, Pontiac, Illinois. Uh, back around 1998-99, uh, right around the turn of the century, Pontiac is a beautiful historic district that centers on a 19th century courthouse. And at that time I was talking to Bob Russell and uh, the former mayor Scott McCoy who initially started this catalyst of transformation. They were running a 97% vacancy rate of their commercial buildings. And right now in their historic district, they're running a 98% occupancy rate. And here's one of the key things to keep in mind. Bob has traveled the road a bit, and he noted when he was in Barstow, the museums were closed often during the week, and when he got there on a Sunday, there just wasn't much to do. And that becomes a catch-22, though. How do you keep your business open if you don't have traffic? But on the other hand, how do you get traffic if your business isn't open? And Pontiac, like I say, is a real, uh, just, it's absolutely amazing, the transformation in this community. Uh, the Pontiac Shield on the back of their museum was, now, was featured on the National Geographic Route 66 calendar. Uh, they, they're a small community. They just had a Hampton Inn open in Pontiac. Uh, this gentleman here, I won't embarrass you by trying to pronounce his name, a Chinese fellow. He was a leading uh, airbrush mural artist in Shanghai, China. He ran a school there. People came from all over the world to school. Pontiac initiated a, a real extensive mural program a few years ago, a mural marathon. And they become very famous for their historic and colorful murals. This Chinese gentleman heard of these murals, went to Pontiac, fell in love with it. The mayor met with him and they worked out a deal. He closed his school in Shanghai and has reopened it in uh, Pontiac. The Society of Gilders, the people who do the uh, gold leaf gilding for centuries, they've just recently opened their official museum in Pontiac. And Pontiac, I just like to say, I was talking to Bob Russell last week, Pontiac has been designated one, uh, in the top five destination cities in the entire state of Illinois. They used Route 66 as the catalyst, but they didn't just focus myopically on Route 66. And they used Route 66 to magnify the attributes of the community and build on it from that point. They've had restaurants open, uh, new museums. The attendance is up again this year. And this beautiful mural in Pontiac, Illinois, it's in the alley behind the museum. This is one of my favorite little towns. And I could actually relocate to Cuba, Missouri if it wasn't in Missouri and there wasn't so many trees and they had a little more desert. But uh, uh, this, this delightful little town is, uh, they started with a good mural program in 2001, was, the, was their primary. They started using that to develop a sense of community and community purpose where people were excited about what was going on. They started working together. And you know, you're not going to get everybody to play nice together. But if you can get the majority to play nice together, 
Okay, and they have transformed this community in more ways than one. With innovative programs, uh, the governor just uh, gave a CUBE curriculum on area history, but with Route 66, and it's sociology, geography, mathematics, they tied it all into Route 66, created a curriculum. And now that curriculum, by the way, is uh, being studied, possibly to be taken as a national program for schools. But they started uh, uh, walking tours, they have started creating uh, tax incentives for businesses and uh, renovation of uh, like uh, the, the four-way cafe there was a 1930s gas station and uh, like I say this is a very small community and these restaurants now a lot of these have just opened in the last couple of years and this is just a short overview of what they've accomplished in a very very short period of time relatively short about 12 years but most importantly, from an economic standpoint, they have made this a place people want to live, not just visit. And their industrial park there, they have a nice light industrial park, now employs more people than live in Cuba. And it's the largest employer in four counties. And some of these things have been a little controversial that they've done. They've started programs, they have a, a local prison there, and they started working with prisoners, teaching them uh, small business ethics, uh, uh, funding, financing, and they've had some of the prisoners now opening businesses when they get out in uh, Cuba. I don't know if any of these businesses were like locksmiths or anything of that nature, but that's, a, that's, an, that's another story entirely. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Uh, Sean Seibert, he's been the, the real driving mechanism. In every one of these communities, there's one face, there's a person that's really been driving this, usually behind the scenes, but now in places like Seligman, they're very vocal. Somebody has a face they can recognize that goes with the community. He says the biggest thing we've been working to do is change the mindset, getting people to think optimistically about the future of their community. And you know, that's very difficult, and I, I imagine, I'm just going to guess that you folks have had that trouble here. Sometimes you feel like you're just running your head against the wall day after day, and you, you just, it just gets tiresome. This is just a quick, uh, there's a few things there in Cuba that they've done. They, they got the community involved in beautification projects, such as uh, you know, just things like old bicycles and flower gardens and, and uh, uh, maintaining uh, roadways and cleaning up parking lots, getting youth groups involved, uh, getting them excited about what's, what's in the community and what the community has to offer. This, this is one of my favorites. Uh, they've got a long ways to go. Galena is still having problems. But Galena is a poster child for a town that has no chance in hell. None. Uh, you, you pick a problem, they've got it. Is, is anybody familiar with uh, Pitcher, Oklahoma? Yeah. One of the nation's largest toxic Superfund cleanup sites where the entire, entire town was bought out and is being demolished. Well, Galena's on the edge of that. Uh, there was a tri-state lead mining area around uh, bracket, the years bracketing World War I. And it was the largest lead mining district in the world. You fill in the blanks what that causes. And so there's parts of Galena, like uh, where the old uh, Pitcher Eagle smelter was at, that are uh, super fun cleanup sites. They're toxic, toxic areas. And this only tells part of the story with the population. In uh, 1921, Galena had a population of 34,000 people. Uh, when they started this project of, of bringing new life to Galena, they had at that time one functioning street light on the Route 66 corridor and the uh, most most of the downtown district looked like what you have coming in from uh, on the west end of town that was that was a lot of Galena and this basically started with four women that took a gas station at a three-way stop sign and they renovated it they started welcoming tourists Simply with uh, Melba started offering people a stop to the stop sign bottles of water and one thing has led to another and the city has gotten very very uh, excited about this. Since 2007 when they really began working on the city 14 properties have changed hands and 20 have undergone private funding rehabilitation. 
One of these buildings, uh, I think it's an antique store now, they, they, they called it the Murder Bedello and different things over the years. I went in and took pictures of it a few years ago because I, I thought it was going to be gone and it had the most beautiful ornate woodwork inside you've ever seen. And when I was taking pictures of it, I was trying to keep my camera dry. It was raining and there was more water inside than outside. And the foundation had collapsed and the building was almost 10 degrees off center. And it's now been renovated and it's just an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous building. But they, they, again, they didn't just focus on tourism. They used the tourism and Route 66 as a component it was the low-hanging fruit. They used that as a catalyst. In uh, 2007, they landed, uh, they beat out Joplin, Missouri for a uh, new state-of-the-art surgery and nursing center. And uh, they've done things like, unfortunately, they've lost a lot of historic buildings, but they've uh, used creation of nice pocket parks to create foot traffic, to give a visibility, and to create that sense of community and uh, vibrancy. And they've had things like the uh, president of the Dutch Route 66 Association was there. There's a revolutionary tree planting initiative in uh, arid or toxic soils. And of course, new street lights all along the Route 66 corridor. And these are an example of some of the pocket parks that they've created, the Galena mural there on the end. Those were all condemned buildings that they took out and, and transformed. This one's kind of hard for me because uh, this is my adopted hometown. Uh, I'm originally from North Carolina, but I've, I've lived in Kingman about two and a half lifetimes now. And the first time I moved there was in the summer of 1966, and we followed Route 66. Now, Kingman has had strong population growth, and in addition to Route 66, and I mentioned the Southwest, Tucumcari is just off the edge here. But the Grand Circle, that is the number one tourism destination in the United States right now for internationals and a lot of domestic people. The Southwest. And Kingman, Arizona, of course, sits right on the edge of that. This is real important as we talk about Kingman and Tucumcari. It's important to note that, however, tourism without positive economic development does not work. It has to result in economic development to be sustainable to keep this ball rolling. Now you would think that a town like, now this is Kingman, we're located on the longest remaining uninterrupted section of Route 66, over 160 miles of Route 66, and some of the most scenic. Uh, that's my personal opinion. You get up towards Oatman and things, I really don't think Stevie Wonder can take a bad photograph. It's, it's really quite spectacular. We initiated the Route 66 Walk of Fame in 2014, and we had, uh, We've created a lot of international uh, attention with this. Unfortunately, they, it was never followed up. It's, right now, it's dormant. Uh, we have facilitated uh, a situation with the uh, Historic Electric Vehicle Foundation in 2014, and I coordinated this with tourism and the city manager, and we created the world's only and the first electric vehicle museum. It's in the process of development and growth. We have an industrial park that's uh, surprisingly stagnant. We haven't had a new business in about uh, five or six years there. But it's also a World War II airfield. Uh, we've got uh, microbreweries opening. We have, we're, we're fortunate with climate. 15 miles we're up. We have a, a county park with a lodge that's about 7,000 feet in the mountains. So we have, we have quite a lot to offer in Kingman, but our tourism has been relatively stale. We've had to do this at the grassroots level. And it's not that the city uh, wasn't aware, they just weren't aware of the potential. So we've had to kind of go backwards and start at the community level, building a grassroots initiative, awareness of what's going on. Like last night, uh, having these uh, 50 people from Norway in your community. It, it's really surprising, even though you have these people running through your town, sometimes you don't see them anymore you don't realize that people are coming to Tucumcari on purpose from all over the world. Now, transforming a community into a destination for visitors, for business owners, and for families, it all begins leadership with vision. And I, I point out Bob Russell a lot because it started with Scott McCoy, but Bob built on this, and Pontiac is something you have to see to believe. 
But he has tremendous vision. And simple, some of it low budget, some a little bit higher. But for one of the things he's done with uh, city employees, he's uh, helped them with their phones and they have apps on their phone with greetings and basic uh, directions and odds and ends in 20 different languages. So they can meet with and speak with people from uh, other countries. It's important to catalog your assets. You might be surprised. Those can range all the way from very colorful and unusual people. Eric, Oklahoma, the only thing they've really got left in Eric is a very strange man. Uh, their, their Harley is uh, very different, but he's, been, 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 but he's become a destination. In Seligman, it's a 90-year-old barber. And one of the most valuable assets they have in Seligman, Arizona. And here, well, you've got quite a few assets. You've got the film and celebrity situation with Rawhide, the other things you've done here. Route 66, of course. You've got a rich railroad history, ranching history. You've got some stunning landscapes here. And you've got a, it's, it's one of the difficult problems is getting people play well together, trying to find ways to, to, to build partnerships. Galena, Kansas is a good example of someone who's done that in Kingman. And Steve Lesur, uh, that's with me today, launched a Promote Kingman initiative, largely for that, transforming the community, building a community of the future, one partnership at a time, and getting, creating community awareness using social media, websites, and events, working with car clubs, working with whatever organization they're having an event, he magnifies it with his promotional initiatives and tries to tie it into other things that we have coming through Kingman. And you've got to come up with creative, non-traditional marketing and utilization. In this day and age, it's really astounding what you can accomplish uh, with social media, websites, uh, video content. Like one of the great steps that you folks take in here is retain the service of this gentleman, KC. Has, is, is, he's very gifted and very talented with this video creation and marketing. And I have, a, I have a feeling that you've created quite a bit of awareness internationally with what you've done. The most important thing is you've got to start with leadership with vision. And even though we've been talking about tourism, heritage tourism, people, communities, have a tendency sometimes to have le leaders with tremendous vision, but unfortunately, they're using the rear view mirror. So the leadership has to have several things. They need to be able to develop partnerships between organizations. Even if they don't get along well together, they have to help facilitate common ground for these people to work together, to find something. You have to build partnerships between the business community and the city, the business owners. Um, people, people get upset. Let's face it, nobody likes government. They, they just don't. And finding ways to show them that the government is a partner and, and not a detriment. And partnerships with neighboring communities. Uh, you know, it's kind of difficult here in the Southwest because neighboring communities are 60, 70, 80, 90 miles away. But you've got some, got some really amazing things taking place. I, well, at the top, I would say trying, trying to work with Santa Rosa and Las Vegas. I think it would be very beneficial if you could find, find ways to work with those communities. Uh, it, would, it would really help immensely because if you can't offer a way for people to come here you know, for two, three days, how about if they come here for a day, Santa Rosa for a day, and Las Vegas for a day, but they start here? And you have them here, for or for day trips. Have them spend three, four, five days in Tucumcari with day trips to Santa Rosa and to Las Vegas. Uh, the other thing you have is international partnerships. This is really difficult. It's mind-boggling for me that Route 66 has this kind of power and draw because it's a road. I've been driving, I've been this thing since 1959. It, it's it's a road, but you have incredible international partnerships at your fingertips. Uh, a great, great example, uh, the, the Blue Swallow Motel. Uh, that's probably one of the most recognized locations on Route 66 in the world. I know the AAA map that just came out for Route 66 has the Blue Swallow Motel on the cover. It's, it's incredible the marketing that you can, you can develop, the brand recognition for your community with, with almost minimal effort by tapping into those partnerships. 
Another problem, especially it, 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 it's a problem in any community regardless of size, but it becomes more so in small communities, unfortunately. And the leadership has to walk a fine balance. There's always going to be a, a divisive element somewhere in the community that builds a, a, a nucleus around themselves, a little core group. And they, every place, they, they're one of those people, they walk into a room and the light bulbs burn out. There's just chaos wherever they go. And it's very, very difficult, but you can negate a lot of their influence by avoiding ways that they get too much public exposure or credibility. And you have to encourage and facilitate creation of diverse grassroots initiatives. I know you had the quarrels here for a while doing a mural program. If you have somebody in the community that comes up and wants to do planters downtown or murals, there's got to be a way you can encourage them to do that and draw other people from the community to work with them. And that goes to finding common ground that allows initiatives to work toward a common goal. Social media is really important because you can encourage instant engagement with people, literally all over the world. Uh, tomorrow morning I'll be doing, I have my own little project, uh, I, I call it Jim Hinckley's America, and it's a, basically a catch-all. And like I said, it's, it's my way of trying to uh, make a living out of telling people where to go. And I do a Facebook Live program, and, and I, I joke about this often, but I'm basically Ma Amish. Anything newer than Model A Ford technology usually baffles me. Uh, I find it very confusing. And I was fascinated with uh, Facebook Live as an example. And I, I started playing with it and seeing if I could sell books. And it was very, it's still a little bit rough around the edges. But I was amazed how it took off, the interest that it had. And so somehow it developed into a community events program in Kingman, an hour long, Friday long program. I've had city council people, I've had the mayor, I've had uh, travelers, tourists, artists, all kinds of people. And it's just basically sit down with coffee and we have a program in the morning and we do this through the Promote Kingman Initiative and Jim Hinckley's America. Well, I'm running about four to 5,000 people a week that watch this. And last week it was from six countries. And we're going to do this tomorrow here in my Facebook Live program. We'll do it live here tomorrow from Tucumcari with uh, KC and um, Melissa from the New Mexico Route 66 Association and a few others. But this is just an example. You know, we get locked into thinking old ways, you know, uh, print media, things of this nature. These are simple things that you can do if you have a personality in your community, a face that you can put with this so that, so that they're recognizable and you can reach out. Video content creation like what you've got going here with KC, that's, that's really crucial because you can get that online and people... Now what you do with them when you get them here, now that's the real challenge. But, but, and, and you have to develop programs of course that educate business owners about modern marketing opportunities. It's amazing the number of businesses today that do not even have uh, websites uh, or social media or things of this nature. And unfortunately, like I say, it's, it's really crucial. I even, know, I even know an Amish company back east that makes antique wooden wheels. And of course, they don't have any, but they've had a, had a company put together a website for them. When the Amish are starting to get websites, you know you're behind the times if you don't have one. <laughs> It, the low-hanging fruit is Route 66. You don't want to become myopic. You don't want to just focus on Route 66. But this is the easy one for you. If you, this this is re, really the the hinge pin. I, I, a lot of you that have businesses here or are, more, are active in tourism probably are already aware of this. But there's currently Route 66 associations in 10 countries, all eight states, and several communities. These these associations are very active. Uh, I spoke last year in Ofterding in Germany at the very first European Route 66 festival. Next year there's going to be a Route 66 festival in the Czech Republic. You have companies that uh, specialize in Route 66 tours operating right now that I know of in five countries. And almost all of those add side trips somewhere in the southwest. Uh, for us in Arizona, of course, the Grand Canyon, you know, things of this nature. 
And Route 66 enthusiast uh, Ian Bowen out on the Santa Monica Pier, a very interesting young man, he says Route 66 is just the gateway drug. And the Route 66 enthusiast develops an interest in, in old highways like 104, which is a beautiful highway, some very unique bridges. You have the one bridge uh, just uh, north of town here off 104. As far as I know, there's only two bridges of that type in the country uh, from 1923, I think that is. But uh, there's tremendous interest in National Old Trails Road, the Ozark, Ozark Trails Highway, which of course ties in with here. You really want to, to boil this down, you have four simple goals. The first one is relatively easy. Encourage people to stay overnight. You know, you've got I-40, you know, and I know that bypasses, but one of the unique things here, that oh, great attributes that you have, uh, vintage lodging is extremely rare. It's very popular with Route 66 people, but it's becoming increasingly popular in, with people that are into heritage tourism. And as some of the motel owners here have probably found out, that creates another problem because when your TripAdvisor reviews go up as a vintage motel, people check in expecting the Hilton and they're terribly disappointed. But you have already the Roadrunner Lodge, the Motel Safari, uh, the Blue Swallow Motel. Th these are exactly what people are looking for. And they're, they're extremely rare. There's a lot of the Route 66 communities they have maybe one, maybe two old motels and, and they're not rentable. Uh, and you've got, of course, a lot of properties here that possibly could be saved. But the ones that you already have, that's an incur incredible asset. The next challenge is a little bit more difficult, is, is how do you get them to stay for the weekend? How do you get them here for a couple days? Getting them overnight is pretty easy, but what, do you, what can you do to keep, get them here for an extra couple days? There again, little side trips, uh, you know, advertising your museums, things of this nature. And then the, the next challenge is how do you reverse the population decline? How do you get people to relocate here? And I know you have some water issues. Most everybody in the Southwest is dealing with that. But, but how do you get them to relocate to, to Tucumcari? What can you offer them? And the fourth one is even another challenge. How do you encourage people to not relocate? How do you get them not to leave to and carry? And those, those, that's, that's, I, those can be quite daunting and challenging. But you have some incredible things here. You know, your, your college here, even though it's small, it's well known for its wind program, wind energy program. What happens if they expanded that into solar and alternative energy? What happens if you expanded that into wind and solar energy and alternative energies? and you established a museum here on the history of alternative energy. And then you started hosting conferences or conventions here. And you started bringing in solar industry and wind. And really, one project, one person can really make a difference. I, I don't know, is anybody here familiar with Winslow or Seligman? That is from here? Uh, have you ever been to Seligman, Arizona? Yeah. So, so Seligman has almost crossed the line. One of the problems that communities get into when they, the light bulb goes on and they realize the money that's rolling down Route 66, they, they become myopic. And you, the people want an authentic experience. They want kicks. They want the Roadrunner Lodge. They, they don't want Cars Land. They don't, they, that's not what they're looking for. Seligman was very much uh, in the 1980s with, with the bypass of uh, Route 66, Seligman went on a death spiral. Uh, something like 60% of their businesses closed in 24 months. Then the, rail the railroad had pulled out. And it was basically one barber. He's now 90 years old, uh, Angel Delgadillo. And he, he, he became the face for the community. He became the spokesman. And now it, it, people from all over the world uh, men, I think. I don't know about the women, but the men stop shaving when they get to Chicago so they can get a haircut and a shave at uh, Angel's Barbershop. And Winslow. Winslow still has a long ways to go, but Alan Affelt, who's taken on two of the properties, the Castaneda and the Plaza in Las Vegas, using the La Posada, he took on the La Posada and renovated a gutted, condemned railroad hotel 
and use that as the catalyst for a pretty dramatic transformation in, in several blocks downtown Winslow. And there again, we don't want to use the rear view mirror. The past is only the foundation. The, 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 it's what you're going to build on it is the situation. And like I say one of the problems we fight in Kingman, to be blunt and very honest, is a lot of apathy and indifference. We are overcoming that. We've, we're, we're an overnight success 30 years in the making in Kingman. We've accomplished more in three years than we did the last 30. But apathy and indifference, they, they can trump any opportunity and potential your community has. And that goes back to the leadership. You've got to have the leadership that can address this. And it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's human nature. Uh, we get so used to seeing the, the sunset every day, we don't see it anymore. Until we're sitting there with somebody from Norway who's just jaws dropping and they're taking pictures. Or the neon, you know, at, uh, at the TP Curios. We drive by it every night and it's kind of pretty, but we don't see it. And then you see some crazy person stand in the middle of the street with a tripod in the rain. And they're from, they came from Germany just to take pictures of it. You know, we, we, it changes our perspective. We have to see it. And one of the things that you really can do is you need to see the community as your visitor sees it. Pretend you've never been to Tucumcari before. What is your impression when you get off the highway at the West End and coming in? You know, it, 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 if you were, if you'd never been to Tucumcari and you started driving the town, would you pull a U-turn and look for the next exit or would you continue driving? And all communities have these problems. It's not just two can carry, but it's, you know, it's learning to address them. And one of the ones that I, I really, and it's difficult because we get very, very set in our ways. Uh, I prefer, people ask me about Kingman and it changes. I personally liked Kingman much better 40 and 50 years ago. I, I thought I just did. It doesn't matter what I think. Kingman's going to change whether I want it to or not. But I can control some of the direction that Kingman changes. And I can't do that if I plant my hooves and, and refuse to let anything change. It won't happen. So it's very important that you emulate Gumby. Be flexible. And embrace the change. We had people that were very, very upset with us when we established an electric vehicle museum, a Route 66 electric vehicle museum in a 1907 powerhouse. People were very upset with us. It's not authentic. It's not Route 66. What are you going to do? Route 66 was always about evolution. The Route 66 of 1950 in Tucumcari was dramatically different from the Route 66 of 1965. It's always been about change. But you have an In-N-Out burger. Well, uh, <laughs> I oh, <laughs> but you, but but you have a Kmart and we lost ours. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh no, I'm just, I'm just going to repeat what she says. Yes, you had the end of the burger. I've eaten there in the past month and it's great. So. <laughs> well, uh, you, so you're familiar. You've been through Kingman. Oh, yeah. Andy Devine. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and like I say, I don't, I'm not much for really proud of some of the things that's happened in Kingman. And I, I'm extremely frustrated. Uh, we've, we've lost, uh, missed a lot of opportunities. And I, I think a lot of folks here in this room that have been fighting this battle for a while are probably uh, frustrated because you know you've missed some opportunities. But there's still a bunch, a bunch there to grab. A lot. And uh, you, you've got a really unique community here. A very, very special community. And uh, I, I think that you can really make this into a place that people want to live, to raise families. And, but it's, it's, never, it's not going to be an easy process. What, can I answer any questions for you, though, on... Yes, ma'am? No, oh, no, I'm trying to swap fly. Oh! <laughs> um, in, in Kingman, we've had to, you know, you mentioned Andy Devine, and that's just one example of one of the opportunities that, uh, that we missed in Kingman, in my opinion, and to show you how we're having to do this on the grassroots level, and we are waking people up. But uh, uh, Andy Devine, of course, was a character actor in the 50s. Andy Devine Avenue was, is Route 66 in Kingman. And uh, the program, This Is Your Life, 1956, they renamed Front Street Andy Devine Avenue. And he grew up at the Hotel Beale in Kingman. 
Uh, Bob Bowes Bell, uh, he's the editor and owner of True West Magazine. He's an author and artist. He also grew up in Kingman. And he spent quite a lot of his money and put together a, uh, an exhibit of Bob Bell's artwork and, and things. His father owned a gas station in the 50s and 60s on Route 66. And he, he created an exhibit at the Visitor Center. And uh, then we have Andy Devine's exhibit at the Mojave Museum of History and Arts. Last November, uh, Bob Bozbell, Andy Devine, and Zane Gray were inducted into uh, the Arizona Music and Entertainment Hall of Fame. Now you would think, since that was on C-SPAN and, and in the London Times and the New York Times, you would think, well here's Willy Wonka's golden ticket, here's a promotional opportunity. No, we never said a word about it. And those are the kind of things, you know, it's really easy to do because we see the same thing every day. But you look at what you have here, this, this facility here, this, this is, is something a lot of communities would be very, very envious of. Well, it's just like when you go to Albuquerque and you, you um, visit with people who are from Albuquerque, you talk about Old Town. They haven't been there in 30 years. They don't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. So for our community to keep on the loop and talk about the things and let people know, just like you said, you know, you've got to, you've got to embrace it and, and let people know. Well, you know, one way you can do that, and it helps build a sense of community and community awareness. You've got some key destinations here, uh, motels and different things. Reach out to some of these groups that are coming through, like the Norwegians last year, last night. Find out if there's a way that you can put together something for them when they come here and invite the community. I'll tell you what we did in Kingman. To try to say we're trying to create an awareness because people don't see this. Uh, on May 16th uh, this year, we had a Dutch motorcycle group stop in Kingman. So through Promote Kingman and the Route 66 Association of Kingman, we got with the uh, owners of the Grand Event Center, put together a nice little $12 buffet dinner for them. And then we got the local car club to play taxi, to pick them up at the motel and drive them down for the dinner. And it, it created a lot of things. The, the car club, mostly retired fellows, the guys like to show off their cars, they had fun. The people from the Netherlands never got to cruise Route 66 in a 66 Chevy Impala convertible or a hot rod. They had a memorable experience that they talk about, but we created community awareness. These people interacted with the Dutch. What, why, why are you on Route 66? Why are you in Kingman? And it created a sense of awareness. And it also created, so a lot of these people were open and honest about the problems they saw. And you know, some of these things are really small, low budget items that you can do like this. Another is to build on KC's efforts. What, how do you, get, you, you take this a step further? He's got the video. Now find a way to have a face at some of these events and distribute, distribute materials, uh, promotional materials, uh, not just on Tucum Carry, but things that's around Tucum Carry, or some of the events that you have, or uh, even start uh, pushing and advertising some of the businesses you have for sale. But create that sense of community. Start interacting with these people from overseas or even domestics. I mean, it, it's always astounding to me. And, and Route 66 has always been about a highway of dreams. And it's more so than ever. These, for a lot of these people, this is an ultimate dream list uh, to travel this road and to be here in the Southwest. And it, it creates... It, it, well, I tell you, it's, it's difficult to find words for something that possesses people to try to stilt walk Route 66 or, you know, especially if you're a French mime. I, I, I find that one really uh, entertaining. But I, I, you'll find people, uh, Rashid Huda this year that I, I met, walked the entire length of Route 66. A retired professor just decided he's going to walk Route 66. Uh, I met a Japanese fella, a uh, long distance runner, who uh, fell in love with Route 66 and the Bunyan Derby, which was a foot race in 1928 long. So he decided to recreate it and for his 48th birthday, run Route 66. And there's so much of that, but you tie that in with what you have here in the Southwest and your location here, there's a lot you can bring to this community, a lot. Do you have a, a lot of absentee owner situations? Yes. That can be a, that can be a challenge because they, they, they don't see that they have a vested interest in the community. 
And that takes a carrot and stick approach, and you may not have to take the padding off the stick. Yes, Nancy? On that topic, could you expand on your brief comment you made about the rearview mirror? We talked about this and how much it applies. <laughs> well, it applies to almost all communities. You know, it's, it's really easy to talk about that song, uh, uh, Bruce Springsteen, about glory days. They're gone. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's just not going to happen. It's important to look at the past. I mean, we're talking about heritage tourism. You know, that's an important component. But you, you, can't, you can't go backwards on this. It's just not a feasibility. It's not a possibility. And so what are people wanting today? And, and the Blue Swallow is a great example. The Blue Swallow does well because it bridges the past and the present and even the future with the electric charging stations. I mean, who do, how, people want, quote, the authentic experience, but they really don't. Who's going to stay at the Blue Swallow Motel without air conditioning? You know, uh, how many people want to have a Great Depression theme park? You know, uh, it's, it's just not, you know, you're not going to, you're just not going to do this. So don't be, a, don't be afraid to, to, to change things. The rear view mirror is, is just, it just doesn't work. It just flat doesn't work. And... Uh, I, I can't say that enough. You've got to embrace the future with this. And that means uh, like, like you're in an ideal situation to capitalize, I said before, on your wind energy programs. You've already got the foundation there. Build on that. Uh, expand on your electric uh, vehicle situation here. Get in with it. There's, and there's so many easy marketing things. Uh, PlugShare. PlugShare.com. Anybody who has charging facilities, even if it's a plug-in in the wall, you can go on plug share, register your business, it's all free. And people who are traveling the road with electric cars, more and more of them, know where to stop and charge their vehicles. So the future, embrace it. It's, it's really the key. And, and getting your young people here, finding out what they're interested in. It can scare the hell out of you, but I mean, it's kind of, you know, see what the young folks are interested in. It might surprise you where these things intersect. Yes, ma'am. Talking about your early morning live show, and I hate to admit this, but you mentioned somebody I don't know, Melissa. Oh, Melissa Beasley. Uh, she's the president of the New Mexico Route 66 Association. Okay, and where is she? Uh, Albuquerque. She'll be here tonight. Okay. That's one thing we're lacking in our community is communication mm -hmm. on what's okay. going on in our community because I don't know anything about it, you don't know anything about it. So if we're us to be able to help promote, uh, well, we there's need been some a lot of times where I don't find out about things until after they've already gone by. And it's like, you know, I'm this, uh, well, this was part. Of, this is part of the reason that Steve asked me to help when he when he started doing promote Kingman. And Steve is a board member with the Bullhead City Chamber of Commerce, and his his basic niche is is using modern technology marketing type thing. And that was one of the big problems we have in Kingman. We've heard this countless times. You know, if I would have known about the car show before it appeared in the paper the week after it happened, I might have gone. And so we started doing this with, with Promote King and using a website and social media. And, and we do events like this uh, Facebook Live program and, uh, and we work with a lot of the uh, organizations in Kingman because creating those partnerships starts with that communication and it's really important because another problem when you don't have that communication is not just events and things that you miss out on but it's it's really kind of sad when uh, David's doing something a project and somebody at the other end of town is trying to do the same project they never talk to each other you have wasted resources of time and money whereas if it was pooled you might get it done but I'm sure, I'm sure everybody gets frustrated. Oh, I don't do Facebook. Oh, I don't listen to the radio. Oh, I don't read the newspaper. Oh, I didn't know that was happening this week. Well, how? We can't go to every No, you cannot. Personally and say, come this. They have to take some of their responsibility themselves. But you can foster that. Uh, you know, find the ways develop the things that you have and the other people will either get on board or they'll wither on the vine and somebody's going to take their place. And it sounds brutal, but that's, that's just the way it is. And uh, we go through, every community you're going to have the people, I mean some of these people are going to cry if you hang them with a new rope. They're just, they're just not, they're, that's, that's their specialty in life. They've made a career out of complaining and, and they're, they're going to continue to do so.
talk about like the uh, event calendar and how we yeah. utilize our, our Facebook page to create the calendar. So like every, let's say you have 100 businesses that have their own events that they're doing, and they're all posting their events on their Facebook page. Um, you can go onto their page and share that event into your own calendar. So one thing that Promote Kingman has done is we literally, every couple days, we are searching for events in the area, we are adding into our calendar, and our calendar, everybody knows to go to that, and it has to congregate all of the events in the area. People who don't know Facebook, you do a Facebook class at the Chamber of Commerce, and you encourage all the business owners, or even the community, just the people living in the community, to come down and learn how to create a Facebook page and watch your page for events. Then you have a centralized calendar. There's one big issue that I had uh, when I started being on the board for the chamber four years ago was there was multiple organizations with multiple calendars, and they were all out of sync, nothing was synced. So one thing that Facebook has been able to do is put it all in one place, and the, the usability of it, the ability to share the event to other people, invite people to the event, um, and also it, when you see your friends going to it, it encourages more people to attend. Um, it's, it's been a huge tool, and then you can, with that calendar, if you have a website, which Promote Kingman does, you can embed that entire calendar right onto your website. So, literally, it's always updating all the time, you have to have touch it, you embed it once. Anytime we add a calendar event into it, it's automatically there, whether it's our event or not, we share it to our page. So it's a really easy way to Steve Steve creates programs, a master class type program. We just did one a few weeks ago. And that also helps build a sense of community. Getting the people together and learning how to do this in, uh, the, in the modern era. I stand there in amazement at some of the stuff that I see people doing with these things because like say, it's, it's astounding. Like when I do this Facebook Live program, it, it's, it's, it's still a little bit rough. It's kind of a Mayberry TV type situation. But when, when you sit down and have uh, well, we end up with internet connection issues and um, I, you know all kinds of little odds and ends, but people seem to enjoy it. And I'm astounded when I'm sitting in a coffee shop in Kingman, Arizona, talking with somebody who's walking Route 66 and a city council meeple, and people are commenting that are watching this from Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium. I find that just absolutely astounding. I, I, I just find that amazing. And these are things that a community really needs to tap into. So where did you run into the group last night? Oh uh, well, it's a roadrunner, and then uh, went down. Some of them were at the Blue Swallow. I went down and talked to them down there. But uh, you've got some key places in Tucumcari, of course, where these folks congregate. But encourage people, encourage your community to, to get to meet these people. Uh, con stay in touch with with your key business owners, and when these groups are coming. And see if there's something you can do to create a community event. Invite people. It, it, reach out to these uh, these tour groups. Jim, I would expand on what Steve was saying. And, and Tuton Carry has a great resource already, the positive change for Tuton Carry on Facebook. You can start, when you, when you all get back to your offices today, you start by just some, saying something positive. Don't be shy. Uh, we all have to promote our businesses. Put, it, put your event right on there. That's a, that's a place to start, and, and it already exists. It already has a following, and, and, and I think it'll be a great success. Yeah, and you've got a great, uh, the Quake County, was it Quake County Facebook page? It's yeah. Positive, proactive change. I'm sorry. Pro, positive change for Tugan Carry. Yeah. It's got the word positive in it, which can't, can't be bad. Yeah. 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 And, and, and anybody can, can jump in, and I think and it's it's an open open page. And, and well, we do have a Tugan Carry community calendar, which a lot of people put on there, and you know, right. share that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I get lost. Yeah. So I, when when I go to try to announce on the radio the community events, if I don't have a paper in hand, oh, I'm trying to go to yeah. you know it's, it's, it gets a little confusing. So we need I need to figure out a, a simpler yes, way of promoting. I think you know. we have a tremendous potential in this town, and maybe it's me from being you know outside of New Mexico. Is when I first came to this town, I landed here on a Saturday afternoon. And there was absolutely nothing to do until Monday. And I think with, especially with all these groups coming through, what we really need to, to capitalize in on is what can we give them to do during the weekend? Exactly. So it's, it's such a tremendous potential that I think we're really missing out on. I mean, and I understand that this is, this is a community that really embraces their churches and religion. 
but there's a lot of places that aren't open on Sunday, you know, and that is just such a huge opportunity we're missing. Yeah, but the biggest problem on that is, is it's easy for somebody to open it, but the, the profit off of it's a different story. Because a lot of people don't go out on Sundays here in the community, but to open the hope to get that tourist, and I'm all for it, because during football season, I'll be open. But that's the only time I see I'll really profit good on Sundays. But it, it goes back to that comment you made about, you know, how do you get the, how do you get the traffic if you're not open? It, it's, we used to see it in retail all the time, you know. You can't make the sales if you're not open. Sure. It, it, it's astounding, and like I say, when you combine what you have here, you know, I, last year uh, I, I was uh, working on another project on US 6, Highway 6, and I was in uh, Iowa and Nebraska. It, it's amazing how bad a lot of, these, a lot of the uh, Plains communities are, are like this or worse, but they don't have the Southwest, they don't have Route 66. You, you've got, you know, you've got really something you can build on. It, 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 I, I'm at a total loss for words when you talk about being open, and it is a challenge to sit in your store all day and never see anybody. That it, it just, it, it, it seems pointless. But these people would so today will market these things for you, and you also have to keep in mind with a lot of this the, the tourism situation. You've got to be thinking a year to 18 months ahead. Uh, the, 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 the people from Norway last night, they've already got their tour schedule set for 2018. So you've got to be, uh, you know, really ahead of that curve. It can be kind of difficult. But you'd be amazed that these people, they will talk about these things. If they stop in your place on a Sunday and you're open, in a week, three, four, five thousand people know that you're open. Literally from all over the world, and it, it doesn't does, doesn't translate to money right away, but it, but every little bit's going to help. It's incremental. It's called positive proactive change for Tucum Carry. There's also you have a uh, the one I was looking at was Tucum Carry Quay County then and now is another that I, I follow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. This has got Brenda and Nancy and a bunch of them have posted on here. Yeah. Finding a way to, to uh, centralize that, you know, putting something together so it's so centralized. Yeah, Dave? I'd like to just highlight some things that you and Casey and Mr. Lesser have all said, and that is promote, 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 right? I hear often people asking the universe, why isn't the city doing something about X? The city, we're the city. All of us are the city. The city doesn't exist without its citizens. Don't wait for permission. You can go ahead and promote somebody else's event. You can promote something that you've seen. You can promote anything through any avenue that you have available to you. And I bet whoever's running that event is not going to be upset. So, so don't wait for somebody else necessarily, please, to spread the word for you. Uh, if you see something that has an impact on the city, um, has an impact on tourism, uh, or local events that has an impact for our local citizenry, it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to wait for somebody else. You don't have to say, why isn't the city doing this? Yeah, that's that's the bottom line. Yeah, I'd say really the grassroots initiatives are the are the key. That's the that's that builds your. You've got to have that sense of community and community purpose. It, it just it's it's crucial. Otherwise, the government becomes just just a job. It's stagnant. It's really it's really not serving. And you've got some really great people in this this community and some passionate people. And uh, I understand you've had three of your old motels sell recently, and uh, you know that, that's pretty indicative of uh, the potential here. What do you see for? I mean, I, I, obviously you want to see. Uh, yeah, obviously you want to avoid having Tucum Carry emulate Glen Rio. Uh, so. I think, but but I mean, you, do you have a, a, something you really want to see for this community? Do you, have you formulated a real vision for it? 
Jim, you had mentioned uh, working with other communities in the area, and we are doing exactly that half of the last six months through the USDA and the Senate 6 issue. Here we have Ruth Ann is on the Tourism Committee. If she hasn't, she just got volunteered. She is. <laughs> I just haven't, I've just been at other meetings when it's met like this. So. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know, Tony's from San Juan. We're working with four, four counties trying to develop exactly what you were talking about, essentially a historical trail of northeastern New Mexico. Yes. <laughs> And when you sit down and talk to all these people, it's interesting and fascinating to me is everything that they're talking about being a really good and interesting stop to see, I've never heard of. <laughs> now, I'm not from this area necessarily, as you know, I'm from Phoenix. I've been here 10 years, and I still never heard of it. And so if somebody that lives here hasn't heard of it, we're obviously not communicating well about the benefits of the region. And so what you were saying is exactly spot on, is we need to cross promote, communicate, make sure everybody's aware of some of the advantages inherent in this area, and just promote, 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 and promote. Yeah. It, it, it. And you've got to do some things, though. You know, you've got the, the groundwork is laid. You're starting to promote. You're, like you said, in the last six months, you started working with communities. You put, you've harnessed his talents uh, to, to, to market this. Now, the next thing to do is build on that. Create that sense of community. And number two, try to really see this as the, the visitor sees it. You know, like the Paradise Motel. Uh, I was really sorry to see, the last time I was through here in October, it, it hadn't been vandalized that heavily. And it's always a shame to lose historic properties because they are tr they're truly irreplaceable. But sometimes losing a historic property can benefit the other historic properties. And sometimes you just have to, you just have to start, a, start a demolition program. One of the community, a couple of communities, uh, Sepulpa, Oklahoma, came up with a carrot and stick approach uh, that seemed to really have some dramatic results with uh, absentee owners and, and owners who were indifferent to the conditions of the property. Uh, the city offered them, uh, came up with grants, they used some of their uh, bed tax monies to offer a matching funds grant that if, even if you can't uh, renovate the property at least the street facing sections have to have clean and the property has to be clean and the street facing sections have to be presentable they can't, they can't look like condemned buildings and failure to do so the city is going to take this down and put a lien on anything you have that we can put a lien on and uh, it was amazing on some, <laughs> some, 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 peop some people decided that Oh goodness! If you only knew. <laughs> oh, this this sounds like a good story. Oh, oh gosh, now that's a hot topic right now in Kingman. Yeah. It's a hot topic in Kingman and a lot of communities. Uh, How are you dealing with it? May I ask? Because <laughs> not well. No. Well, we we had to we had to go through a recall because they had one gentleman so upset with us that he recalled three of us, but it didn't work. And, uh, you know, we sh we're still, I mean, I just noticed on the positive, proactive, took them, carried just now. This lady posted pictures and was driving it back. And I'm going, this isn't positive. Yeah. Yeah, right. This isn't a place to put this, I don't think, about has she got noticed that her weeds need to be cut. Well, you know, Bob Russell in, uh, you know, uh, keep your chin up. Like say, uh, one of the key things, I think, for your position, if you're going to do this in a, com in a community and be in the city and, and be proactive, uh, you do have to, uh, you have to have pinata experience. I mean, you really do because you're going to take a beating. But, but it, it's, it can't, it's got to be done. Uh, Bob Russell, if it's any encouragement, like say Pontiac is, I wish we could get a field trip together. You, you wouldn't, Pontiac is just an amazing transformation. And Bob has suffered through two recall elections. 
And uh, even though the, the, the community is being transformed, the bottom line is they didn't fix the potholes on one street as they should have because they diverted some of the money towards another project and postponed that for a while and somebody got upset. It's, it's, it's just the nature of things. Yes? I'd really like to see, too, in addition to embracing the whole historic area, is we have a college here that really has some incredible opportunities for people. Um, every time I talk to somebody at the Bannister Museum, somebody that's local, they have no idea that we have the only one two-year paleontology program in the entire country. Mm -hmm. um, we had researchers that visited us from Norway this year, some of them went out on digs with, with axial aggression, and it's, it's something that you know, locals don't know about. Take, take it. The college just, you know, I, I grew up near Dartmouth College, and the opportunities for a college town are really, really, really phenomenal. And I, I mentioned something on Facebook the other day about the college, and I got, oh, you know, we have another college over here. Oh, you know, we don't need X, Y, and Z about the college, but we really need to embrace this incredible, you know, history sure. that we have here in town. Well, you have two programs at the college, you know, your wind energy program and the paleontology and program. Swap spoke to Altrusa, you know, recently about, you know, we've got people from all over the country now that are saying, oh, we need to send our people here to train. Right. And he's busy all summer long training people from around the country. Take both, take both of those ideas. Just, just for a moment, just imagine this. Take those two, two ideas right there a step further. You, you have this beautiful dinosaur museum. It, it, it's, it's world class. You have this very interesting paleontology situation. What, is, what happens if you expand on that? You create a heritage tourism cultural experience. People come for a paleontology dig to Tucumcari. They become involved with this program. Then you tie it in with this beautiful convention center you have here. And you have, uh, have a convention on fossils, geology, paleontology. You bring people into, in on that. And the same like we mentioned with alternative energy. What happens if you expand the wind energy program into solar and, and things of that nature and then start, start, did some conferences here on that, tying it in with the college. Is there all ways that you can put Tucumcari in a positive light and bring, bring things into Kingman or into Tucumcari and you're, you're also embracing the future as well as your past? Yeah, we do a, a paleontology day every summer. Usually we do two of them, but this year there just wasn't enough people to do two of them. And I think that you know, a lot of that goes to we need to cross-promote each other. Well, well, share. How much advertising on that? That, unfortunately, the college didn't do a fantastic job on the year, but you know, 